Well, had another question come in, and so I want to do my best to try to answer this question this evening. Uh, but it's good to look out and see each of your faces. I hope that you had a restful day, and I'm glad that you chose to come out and be with us this evening. I am a little jealous of Pastor Evan, his hour-long nap and then walking his dog. <laughs> Brother coming in fresh as the dew on a morning rose. and Haggard old preacher up here trying to preach, so I'm going to do my best. But here's the question that came in. It said, hey, can you help me understand what this verse means? And the question quotes Revelation 4.11. It says, what does it mean to burn forever and ever? So first off, let's go, to the, let's go to the text. Grab your Bibles, please. And if you have one of the pew Bibles, we're going to go to Revelation chapter 14. And this, of course, is on page 1678. It's actually verse 11, so let me back up one. So 1677, Revelation 14 and verse 11. Are you with me? This is in the context of something I'm going to touch on this evening, this, um, this grouping of three angels' messages. And each of these angels flies across um, heaven and makes an announcement, makes a decree, declares something to, to John while he's in vision. And so as we look at this, we can see from verse 9 which angel is talking in verse 11. So this is the third angel's message out of the three. And it says, we'll just pick up in verse 9. A third angel followed them, saying with what type of voice? It's a loud voice, so this is an indication that it's something to be widely talked about. Okay, A loud voice, and if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand. Verse 10 says, He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He, this person who chooses to follow after the beast, this person, whoever that might be, be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb. And then verse 11 says, The smoke of their torment ascends how long? Forever and ever. So, so here is the basis for the question. What does forever and ever mean? How do we, how do we understand that biblically? Well, here's, here's what we have to define. What does the word forever mean? And please know, I'm not trying to play President Clinton. Some of you are old enough to remember what I'm talking about. My Zers and late millennials are looking at me like, Clinton, who was that? <laughs> Who's he talking about? Well, when, of course, when President Clinton was accused of having a sexual relationship with Monica Lewinsky, right, he says, well, it depends on what the definition of is is. He was trying to play some semantic games. So I'm not trying to play semantic games, but I want to ask the question, how does the Bible define forever? Is that a fair question, yes or no? Because I really, honestly, as I've told you before, my opinion and your opinion really doesn't matter. Let's ask the Bible how forever is defined. So I want to walk you through a couple of examples of how the Bible uses forever, and let's see if we can come up with a definition of what forever means. First, I want you to join me in Deuteronomy 15. So we'll back up Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. And which chapter? Chapter 15. These new Bibles, the pages stick together a little bit, don't they? Deuteronomy 15, and we're going to come down to the section. It starts in verse 12 where it talks about the law concerning bond servants. And this is on page 237 of your pew Bibles, the blue pew Bibles, the law concerning bond servants. And I won't take time to read all of this, but it goes through talking about how after a certain period of time, people are supposed to be released. Wouldn't it be nice if after a certain period of time you were released from your debts? A lot of people just ride that clock, wouldn't they? If I can just hang in there, I only got two more years and they have to let me out of it. Well, pay your bills, right? Be a good citizen. If you take the debt, repay it, amen? But it was a little different system back then. If you couldn't pay it, you had to become a bond servant. 
But notice it says, if it happens, verse 16, if it happens, if this, this bond servant that you're going to release, if it happens that he says to you, I will not go away from you because he loves you and your house since he prospers with you, verse 17 says, then you shall take an all, A-W-L. Some of you will know what an all is. Others will not. An all is a punch. It's going to be a metal instrument uh, anywhere from about four to six inches long, and it's going to be about as big around on the end, in, in many cases, about the end of this pen. And it's just going to be a metal punch used to, to punch holes through leather goods, right? If you've got a belt, that, that same kind of punch. So it's saying, take this awl, notice what the awl is doing. Take the awl and thrust it through his what? To the... So you take them up to the doorpost, hold their ear up to the doorpost, and you take the awl and punch a hole through their ear. That's a bad... I don't know how hygienic it is. I don't know how many infections. I don't know how many people's ears rotted off, Morgan. But it, but it scares me, if I'm just being honest with you. But notice what it says here. Thrust it through his ear to the door, and he shall be your servant for how long? Forever. Is God trying to say that that person who has bound themselves to you voluntarily, is, do you believe that God is trying to say that they will be bound to that other person as a slave into eternity? Doesn't make sense, does it? Right? So forever has to have a context. So out of curiosity, I said, I wonder what the Hebrew word is here. And so... I looked up the Hebrew word, and it is a very simple Hebrew word. It's the Hebrew word ad, not O-D-D, A-D. We would say it kind of like ad, right? It looks like the short for an advertisement, but it's ad. And ad just simply means, the definition means as far as. So think through that for a second. So he shall be your servant as far as life lasts. Right? So at least this definition and this context here in Deuteronomy for the word forever simply means as long as that person would live. They're choosing to bond themselves to you for as long as they live. Let's look at another example. Go with me now to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel, we're still in the Old Testament. And we're going to go to 1 Samuel chapter 1. As soon as I find the page number, I'll tell you. It's page 337, 337 in your blue pew Bibles. Elkanah and Hannah are trying to have a son, and Hannah has been barren. She's been unable to conceive a child. She's been grieved about that. She's wanted a child, and so she's been praying, and she, she makes a promise to God. And notice what she says. We're in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Pick up in verse 19. It says, Then they rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord and returned and came to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife. So knew, of course, again, is that phrase just like we saw in Genesis the other night. It's that he had sexual relations with her. He slept with his wife. And Hannah conceived and bore a son and called his name Samuel. And Samuel is a combination of two Hebrew words. The first part is Shema, and the last part, the E-L, is a shortened form of Elohim. Shema means to hear. El is Elohim. So Shamuel literally means God hears. So in other words, I'm naming him God hears because God heard my prayer to give me a son. Very symbolic name. So anybody you know that's named Sam or Samuel, their name means God hears. Now notice what happens next. Verse 21. Now the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer a sacrifice, excuse me, went up to offer to the Lord a, the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, not until the child is weaned. Then I will take him that he may appear before the Lord and remain there for how long? 
if you know the story of Samuel's life, he was given over to Eli the priest, and he grew up under his tutelage, kind of an, an acolyte or an apprentice, if you will. And of course, eventually, Samuel became a prophet of God, right? Someone through whom the Lord um, spoke through. Now, question for you. Is Samuel still serving in the temple? But Hannah was giving him over to serve in the temple for how long? Forever. Here we have a different Hebrew word. In the previous example, in Deuteronomy, it was ad, right? Which, which meant as long as. The Hebrew word that's being used here is olam. O-L-A-M. So what does the word olam mean? Again, I looked that up, and it just means a long duration. So again, we don't have a definition so far emerging that forever means for the ceaseless ages of eternity. Both examples that we've seen being used in the context of someone's life, um, and, and do we ever use the term forever in a hyperbolic or euphemistic way? How many of you have ever gone to the DMV to get your license? You know what that laugh was? That laugh was trauma. <laughs> that was trauma laughs. Did you hear? Oh, I, 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 some of you in your heart, your heart just sank at the thought of going to the DMV, right, and sitting there for hours. We use those terms, though, right? And, and we don't mean that it lasts forever. We mean, man, it felt like a long time. Let me give you another example. I want you to go with me now to the minor prophet of Jonah. And in so Jonah... You're going to be looking for page 1179. Page 1179. Those little minor prophets, they kind of blend together. And in these thin pages, it's kind of hard to get there. So look for page 1179 and go to Jonah chapter 2 with me. Do you remember the story of Jonah? Jonah was called to go to Assyria. He was actually called to go to what is now modern-day Iraq, the city of Mosul. It's where I was stationed with the United States Army. But where did Jonah go? He fled to Tarshish. How'd that work out for him? A great storm blows up, right? And all of a sudden, these guys on the boat, they're like, somebody here is bringing the wrath of God on us. It was not a cruise ship. Jonah speaks up and he says, hey, it's me. I'm the cause of your trouble. So they throw Jonah overboard. And Jonah, thrown into the ocean, and he is swallowed. People say a well. Other translations just say a great fish. Let's read this a little bit. We're in Jonah chapter 2, verse 1. Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the fish's belly, and he said... I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and floods surrounded me. All your billows and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temples. The waters surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. In other words, I sunk down to where the base of the mountain finds the floor of the sea. That's pretty deep, right? He's being very graphic here. And the earth with its bars, look at verse 6 with me. The earth with its bars closed behind me for how long? Question for you. Is Jonah still floating in the belly of a fish? How long was Jonah in the belly of the well or the belly of the fish? Well, a long time. Three days, right? And, of course, he was eventually spat up on the, on the banks of the Tigris there somehow, ends up in Nineveh, and he goes, and he's the most successful evangelist of all time, and he's whining about it. Unbelievable. Only evangelist to ever convert an entire city and the king and he goes in and sits outside the city sulking about it. Again, the word that's used here is the Hebrew word olam. So, so what kind of picture is emerging so far? What does forever mean in many contexts that we're seeing? 
it means as long as it lasts. Okay, if God tells you, you will dwell with me forever, how long does that forever last with God? Does it have an ending? Right, but there are things that do have an ending and that are clearly depicted as such in Scripture. And so as we look at these things from the Bible, we want to make sure that we're not missing something. So let's ask another question. Back in Revelation 14 and verse 11, when it says that the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, what's the Greek word that is used there? I knew you were going to ask, so I looked it up. The Greek word that's used there is ion, or eon, sometimes it's pronounced, but it just literally means translated as a space of time. So the picture that we have that emerges from Scripture is that when it says that the wicked, the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, it really literally translates from biblical context to mean that it ascends through a space of time. Now, we don't know exactly how long that is, but... I want you to see something with me. Go back with me to Revelation. And we're going to have an entire presentation that will talk about this more in depth. So this is just a little quick overview. But go with me to Revelation chapter 20 this time. I want you to pick up with me in verse 7. Revelation chapter 20, in which verse? Are we there? Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison, and he will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. And then it references this Old Testament enemy of God, Gog and Magog. And it says, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from where? From God, out of heaven. And what did it do? Now, some of you may be wondering, what does the word devour mean? How many of you have ever seen teenagers eat groceries? I know what devoured means. So put these pieces together. If the Bible gives a picture that forever means a space of time, a span of time, as long as something lasts, and then we have other biblical teaching that says that there was a fire that came to consume the devil and the wicked, and that, that fire did what? It devoured them. So we don't know exactly how long that span of time is of the destruction of the wicked or the devil and his angels, but it's not something that burns for the ceaseless ages of eternity. Here's another thing to keep in mind. When you and I read in 1 Corinthians 15, do you remember that it said this corruptible must take on incorruption and this deathable, you remember? Or this mortal must take on what? If the wicked were burning through the ceaseless ages of eternity, is that a form of immortality? It's not a peaceful immortality, but what we have presented in Scripture is that immortality is a gift for the righteous, not an instrument for the ceaseless torture of the wicked. So it's a little brief overview, and I know I've got some of your wheels turning, and some of you, this guy's crazy. Well, that's beside the point. <laughs> so far, all I've done is taken you to Scripture, right? And I've showed, shared with you the Hebrew words. I know you have to take my word for that, but I'm happy to show you from a Hebrew Bible if you want to see it for yourself. But my point is this. Let's let the Bible interpret itself, right? Let's not take our modern-day English mindset, Western mindset, and apply to Scripture when those things were written very clearly from a Hebrew mindset, okay, from a biblical mindset. But hang on, there's going to be an entire presentation that's coming up about what happens to the destruction of the wicked.